Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and this is Silicon Dojo, where we offer authorityless, gatekeeperless, free to the end user technology education uh, that hopefully will empower you uh, to solve whatever problems it, it is that you have with technology. Uh, please do remember that free to the end user doesn't actually mean free. It does require money to be able to do all of this kind of stuff. So if you have a couple of bucks, if you're willing to throw it into the uh, uh, crowd funding link down below or wherever it is around this particular video and that would be ever so helpful again <laughs> rent costs money big ass LCD screens cost money doing these classes actually kind of costs a couple of dollars so if you're able to throw a couple of dollars in that would be oh so wonderful so it's a brave new world. This is a brave new world. If you are watching this in chronological order, if you are watching this sometime around August of 2021, you will know the world has changed for me a little bit. Um, I really had the, the idea, the focus on making Silicon Dojo an in-person, hands-on technology program, and then the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> have come out and here in Asheville we, we now have the mask mandates uh, that, have, that have completely come back in Asheville and Buncombe County and beyond that I, I think things are gonna get worse <laughs> I'm just saying, as a, as a decision maker, as a business person, I think things are going to get worse. So I've had to shift up my plans uh, for what I'm going to be doing with Silicon Dojo. So the idea had been Silicon Dojo was going to be an in-person first type of business with online content, basically uh, as kind of like an add-on, kind of like an additional thing. Now with how things are going... <laughs> Silicon Dojo is going to be an online first uh, type of business and you know maybe maybe we will be able to get together and build little Arduino projects I don't know 2024 my bet is 2024 if it's 2024 right now and you're watching this video tell me if I was right or wrong in that why that's important is I have been doing uh, kind of like one shot seminars uh, so I'll take one subject I'll do an hour to two hour seminar on it and then I just flip over to the next subject right because the idea was these are just supposed to be informational things uh, with mainly pushing for people to come to the in-person experience. Now that we're going to be doing things primarily online, what I've decided to do is we're just going to do entire series of videos at this point. So this is actually the first part in the cybersecurity series. Um, at this point, I have 15 classes, entire classes outlined out, and probably, as that goes, it'll probably end up being about 20. And so this is going to be the first class in a, probably a 15 to 20 part series. Each single part in the series will discuss different things. So today, we're just going to do an introduction, talk about what cybersecurity really is in the real world. Most likely, the next video is going to be on things like physical security and operational security. Then we'll be talking about viruses and disaster recovery and every single thing is going to be a class. So if you're interested in the subject, um, follow on and watch the additional classes. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel or keep track of my videos uh, one way or the other. So that, that's, that's what's going on if you're a little bit confused. And if it's 2024 right now and you know, you're know you still locked into your apartment because COVID-53 has come down the pike, well, <laughs> I caught it. I caught it. Anyway, look, sometimes you gotta laugh. Here's the thing about being a real decision maker. The thing about being a real decision maker is sometimes you just gotta laugh, right? Because if you're not a decision maker, if you're not actually having to do something, it's really easy just to just kind of fall into this hole of depression and talk about how horrible everybody is and scream about politics or whatever else. Here's the thing, I have my opinions on politics. I have my opinions on politicians. I have my opinions on science. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I have to deal with the world that actually exists. And so sometimes you just gotta giggle. Sometimes you're like, oh, this is not how I thought things were gonna go. Anyways, okay, so this is an introduction class, you know, I, uh, introduction to cybersecurity. Again, if you've seen uh, previous videos I've done, I have done videos on cybersecurity before, all kind of just dumped into one particular video. Uh, the difference about this particular class is we're gonna step through about 22 different slides. I'm gonna talk about some of the basic concepts in cybersecurity, and then we're going to flesh those uh, concepts out later. Now, I do know some of the viewers, especially if you're watching this on YouTube or any other 
kind of a social media platform, you're probably going to sit there, you're going to look at how long this particular class is and go, oh my god, I, I can't believe this guy talked about just the introduction to cybersecurity for like an hour or two hours or whatever else. D doesn't he know he could have said all of this in five minutes? Here's the thing, this is an actual class. One of the things that makes me different from a lot of the other uh, content creators out there is I am doing education. I'm not just kind of throwing words at you, <laughs> seeing what the hell sticks. Uh, again, I have a video on the OSI model, 45 minutes where I talk about the OSI model being just demystified. Biggest complaint on that particular video is he could have said all that in five minutes. It didn't take 40. And it's like, well, yeah, I could have said the words in five minutes. <laughs> But in order to get you to understand the concepts, it takes a lot longer than that, right? Education is different than sitting and watching a video. Uh, again, not throwing anybody under the bus. I was just, I was watching, I've been watching Network Chuck. Oh my God, that guy like is ADD. Plus he drinks, drinks like a mug of coffee. And then he jump cuts his videos to high hell and back. Where, you know, I guess he says a lot in like 10 minutes. <laughs> kind of makes me nauseous, to be honest with you. Um, and so I think that's one of the things, especially a lot of people that are trying to get into the cybersecurity world, is realize, like, this this is a skill set, right? Like, when you're a tech professional, it's not money for nothing. Once you understand how technology works, once you understand the mindset to deploy technology, it seems easy. Like, once you get your CCIE, then doing the job is ridiculously easy, and it looks like you're making money for nothing. The problem is nobody wants to go to the effort to get the CCIE, and that's where everything kind of falls apart. Same thing is true with cybersecurity, right? Cybersecurity, there is a lot that goes into cybersecurity. If you just watch a couple of videos, or if you watch classes where they're like five minutes a piece, and this one talks about malware in five minutes, this one talks about firewalls in five minutes, this one talks about I don't know, operational security in five minutes. The reality is just, just because you sat in front of a video and hit the play button and had the words wash over you, that doesn't actually mean you've learned anything. What we need as technology professionals, as business people in the tech world, we need people to solve problems. We need people to deploy systems. We need people to build things. You can only build things if you actually know what the hell is going on, right? And so yes, this whole series, this class will be long. This whole series is gonna be long. Cause I, I will admit, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna actually try to teach you people about technology. It's horrible, it's just truly horrible. Anyway, so the first thing to be thinking about when we start thinking about cybersecurity is what, what is the point? <laughs> what is the point? Well, you lie, you lie. The, the point of cybersecurity is that I, I wanna make a lot of money uh, okay, and, and I want to drive a fancy car, uh, okay, and I want respect, uh, okay, and I don't just want to be laid off all willy-nilly. That's great. <laughs> what the hell does that have to do with cybersecurity? <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I understand. I want to get paid and the rest of that. I want to have a nice car. But, but that's not what cybersecurity is about. Again, one of the big problems we get to and then the real world of technology is <laughs> one of the issues is... <laughs> People come in into this thinking the point is not necessarily what it actually is. But we start thinking about cybersecurity, and the most important thing for you to start considering is what the hell is the point? Why do you actually have a job? Why did somebody hire you? Why is somebody paying you a ridiculous amount of money to do something that to most people seems relatively easy. And the reason that you're going to be doing this in the cybersecurity world is the first reason is to prevent the loss of data, right? So in the cybersecurity world, the big thing is you don't want to lose data. Uh, whether it is a ransomware attack where all of your, you know, your database uh, gets encrypted, uh, whether it's a flood that comes through and takes your entire server room uh, downstream, uh, whether it's hard drives that that just fail and fry themselves, right? Uh, if you have loss of data, that can be a major uh, damaging moment for your business. And again, depending on what that data is, your business may be over. If you if you have the CRM solution, so the database back in for your customer relationship management solution, and that database truly disappears overnight, and you have a fairly large company, a company of a couple of thousand employees, 
that may basically be the end of your company, right? If all of the billing information is in there, if all the credit card information is in there, if all the, the, all the historical data about every single customer you have, if that's in the database, and that disappears, you know, whether it's for ransomware, whether it's for a flood, whether it's because the hard drive fails, well, again, businesses do run on data. That's a bad thing. So one of your big jobs is to prevent the loss of data. Even if a system fails, even if a database gets encrypted, even if a hard drive you know, melts itself, the data itself should not be gone. Uh, the next thing you need to be thinking about in the modern world of cybersecurity is to prevent downtime, right? So again, I've been doing technology since 1996. I've been in the IT world since 99, 2000. And so back in the old day, really, and one of our priorities was simply loss of data, right? Well, the entire server room melted down, but we have tapes. You remember running around these big old stacks of tapes? Don't worry, we got all the data for the company. They're all in these tapes. Yeah, there's supposed to be 50 tapes here. F crap, I only found 49. Don't worry, I'll find the 50th somewhere. And that, that's how it used to be, right? Even if your server were melted down, hey, you had tapes. You still had the data, so you were doing your job. Here's the thing. <laughs> this, this is going to be hard. This is going to be hard for a few people to hear. It's not 2000 anymore. 20 years have passed, in fact. And not only has 20 years passed in technology, but also 20 years has passed with the expectation of the end users, the expectations of the executives, the expectations of what happens after a failure. And in the modern world, one of the big things that, that, that's very important is simply to prevent downtime, right? In the world of Amazon, when people pick up the phone, when they go to your website, when they do whatever it is that they're doing, they expect your systems to work, right? If something happened, everything goes down, you got all the tapes, you may have the data, but it's in an unusable format, right? 50 tapes, 50 tapes is functionally actually worthless to you until you can put it back onto systems and get it back up and running. And depending on how bad the disaster is, that might be a week or two, which is really bad for your business. So one of the things in the cybersecurity world we're also looking at at this point is um, basically disaster recovery scenarios, not just backup scenarios, but disaster recovery scenarios. If systems fail, how can we get uh, replicant systems up as fast as possible? We hear about this with something called high availability. So high availability is where you can have physical machines so you can and physical servers, if one physical server fails, melts, whatever, get you, get, get, gets UFO, the, the, the aliens come down and they abduct that server and walk away with it, right? The other server recognizes that the first server is down, the other server automatically uh, comes online, it basically is set to be active, uh, and then everybody gets whatever services or resources that they need. That's something called high availability. Uh, something interesting nowadays, if you haven't taken a look at it, really, really cool, there's this company called Veeam, V-E-E-A-M, they deal with that disaster recovery. One of the things that they, that, their third parties allow uh, to happen now is something called disaster recovery as a service. So backups, backups of servers can now basically be created so that they're actual virtual machines. So your server, it's not that you simply back up the data on the server, you back up the entire server as a virtual machine that can get spun up. What's really cool with disaster recovery as a service, you can back up that machine as a virtual machine you can then basically have that uploaded to off-site to a disaster recovery as a service provider and basically it just sits there as an offline backup solution, right? So normally everything backs up, gets backed up into this virtual machine, gets, uh, gets uploaded to disaster recovery as a service provider, and it sits there. It's your disaster recovery, or it's your, your backup. But what's really cool is if a tornado comes through, wipes out your entire data center, your data center go bye-bye. What's really cool is that you can actually then spin up the instances of those servers on that disaster recovery as a service infrastructure. And within a couple of hours, all of your servers are working within that virtualized infrastructure just like they would be in your physical location. And now your Active Directory was working, and now your CRM is working, and now all of those systems are working how they're supposed to. Now it'll cost more. <laughs> you, you do not want to be using this forever and ever, but you know you have it running up there for a month or two until you can build your data center again, and therefore you don't have downtime. Not only have you not lost data, but you haven't lost time uh, when you can be shipping products and when you can be uh, selling to customers and all that kind of thing. Um, prevent systems from being used nefariously. 
So this is pretty obvious. Uh, we have all kinds of weird ass stuff when it comes to systems being used nefarious and that nefariously now. Um, you know, crypt crypto mining on your Active Directory server. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh my golly. <laughs> Oh, the jackassery that we get in the modern world is just amusing sometimes. But it's true. They've, they've had issues where people's Active Directory servers and such have been mining cryptocurrencies. Or they have been being used in botnets. Or any of a number of other stupid things have happened. So you don't want that to occur. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, point of cybersecurity, is to stay compliant with laws and regulations. Uh, that's right, little noob. That's right. Part of your job is laws and regulations. No, no, no new, no new technology professional ever wants to worry about laws and regulations. Laws, regulations, taxes, asset depreciation. Oh my God, the horror in a new, a new technology person's eyes when you talk about asset depreciation. Right. But again, that's one of the things that we're responsible for. Understanding what our company does, understanding what our company provides to its customers and clients, and then understanding what regulatory environment we're in and making sure that we stay compliant with that regulatory environment, right? So if you're dealing with credit card transactions, verifying and making sure that you're PCI compliant. If you're dealing with healthcare records, verifying that you're HIPAA compliant. Now, a whole bunch of countries, and again, I'm not going to argue about one side of the countries or the other side of the countries. Every country is losing its mind at this point. Uh, what is it? Data, data nationality or well, what is it called? There's a term for it. But every country nowadays wants their citizens' user data stored within their country or within a partner country or that type of thing. And so one of the things you have to think about from a cybersecurity standpoint is where is your data being stored? Where is your user's data being stored, right? If you're a company and you're in Spain and you're using AWS, are you verifying that you're using the right regional data center? This is one of those things that you need to think about from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to be talking talking about a little bit today, going over these kind of concepts, and then we'll, we'll go over more products and stuff in the future. Uh, the first big thing to understand uh, when you start doing cybersecurity is don't do harm. <laughs> or try not to. <laughs> try not to. This is, this is one of the biggest problems you get in the cybersecurity world, especially with like new cybersecurity professionals. <laughs> that, ah, I have my security plus. <laughs> I'm going to lock down the systems. Yeah, yes, but if you lock down the system so that the users can't use the systems. <laughs> if the users can't use the systems because hackers took down your infrastructure, or the users can't use the systems because you made the infrastructure so secure they couldn't use the systems. Um, at the end of the day, how is how is that better? Um, and this is a big problem you get. Again, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the new folks out there, they go through, they, they've read these case studies, they know how to do stuff, you know, buy the book. And then they go out and do crap by the book in the real world. <laughs> Everything goes to hell. So one of the big things as a cybersecurity professional is going to be using your discretion. The idea of discretion is you see a problem. There's 20 ways to try to solve the problem and trying to figure out the best way to solve the problem for your environment, for your situation, for your user base. It is going to be different for every single company. It's going to be different no matter where the hell you are. It's going to be different based off of resources and all kinds of different things. The big thing is making sure that your company can actually ship whatever product that they're trying to ship. Again, one of the big problems we get to in the technology world is, um, we know technology professionals have been so important for so long at this point. I don't know, technology professionals, you know, they kind of sort of feel like the company is there for them. <laughs> like, my servers is what makes this company important. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> the company makes money by shipping products. Your servers allow them to ship those products more efficiently, X, Y, or Z, but your servers themselves are, are not, not the most valuable thing there. And so one of the problems you get to is, again, you have, you have people come in, they start locking down systems, and idiocy ensues. Um, I think about this with, uh, I had one, one client of mine, and they, they had hired a company for cybersecurity, and they were, they were a publishing company. They are a publishing company. But you have to understand, for this publishing company, it was two people. It was two people on their, their third floor. They actually did publish books. It's amazing what you can do with subcontracting and all that nowadays. Anyways, they, they had the, the security professional come in and lock down all their systems. Literally gave them a book. <laughs> gave them a book. 
<laughs> like these 60-year-old publishers. <laughs> and their systems weren't doing with that. Like, they weren't even printing. They couldn't even print. And then I go at it, I'm like, okay, what the hell's going on? You've got a lot of stuff going on here. Why? You have two computers. And I'm like, well, we hired the cybersecurity professional, and they came in and did an audit, and they locked out our system. <laughs> and they gave us this book. <laughs> oh, I spent like the next eight hours <laughs> ripping out cybersecurity crap. Um, because the problem was it locked everything down to, to such a degree that they, they literally couldn't do their job, right? And so that's that's one of those things that you have to be thinking about. You have to think about the... Uh, uh, you know the the quality of the user base, the, the knowledge of, of the user base. Do, do do your users understand what a port is? Do your users understand whether they should, they should click yes or no uh, if a dialog box pops up? Pops up, right? If if you're dealing, if your users, if you're an IT person for a development company, an IT development company, tech development company, um, you may be able to have very high level cybersecurity policies because people know what the hell's going on. On the other hand, you know, two 60 year old publishers with their publishing company on the third floor of their house, you might want to calm down on that cybersecurity stuff. Because at the end of the day, if they can't publish books, they're going to go bankrupt, right? Again, it's all, well, well, at least they didn't get ransomware. It's like they still went bankrupt, right? Bankrupt is bankrupt. Um, I think about this with one of my clients. What was it called? ISA? Oh, I used to hate that thing. Uh, so Windows, it was like internet security and an acceleration server or something like that. Anyways, it was supposed to be like the, this enterprise class firewall thing for Active Directory. It was miserable. <laughs> Maybe you could get it right. Maybe if you spent 40 hours configuring this thing, it worked like a charm. Every time I saw this thing implemented, it was always implemented as backwards. Now, and that was one of the problems, is, is my, the CEO for the company that I was dealing with, um, they had had I, the ISA uh, installed uh, on their server, and then afterwards, Literally, there were there were things that he needed to do throughout the day, um, and it would fail. It would just it would just fail out. Uh, and the problem was was that ISA was 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 killing killing the connections every time he tried to do certain things. It would just kill the connections. And so what was allowing him to make money, uh, or had allowed him to make money, was not functional with within the building. And so one of the things was to go through rip out ISA. <laughs> Re, re, reconnect everything so that it worked a hell of a lot better uh, and go from there. And so that, that's something that you really need to be thinking about uh, when you think about doing, doing cybersecurity. Uh, again, I, I did uh, an executive protection training course years and years ago back when I did that whole emergency services stuff and all that. Um, and one of the most important things that the, the instructors taught us, it was like our job as protection specialists was to protect our principals, our clients essentially, uh, not just in the moment of a violent attack, but also making sure you didn't escalate a problem so that your your client, your principal, uh, didn't receive damage later, right? So when you go to an executive protection class, I mean, you've got a lot of ex-military people a lot of ex-police people, a lot of people that, you know, <laughs> violence is enjoyable. <laughs> let's just, let's just say, look, look, I'm not going out there trying to beat up anybody, but hey, if you, if you give me my hand, if you give me your hand, if you decide to lay hands on me, well, well, I'm more than happy to dance, right? But the problem is, that's a big problem in the executive protection world, right? Because if somebody lays hands on you, there's a lot of ways that you can hurt them. The issue is, right, if you're protecting your principal, somebody comes at your principal, you go all Bruce Lee on their ass, put them into the hospital, and then a month later, your principal is being sued for a million dollars. Did you actually protect your principal? Well, well, they laid hands and I took them down. Yeah, but if your principal is being sued later, you didn't actually protect them now, did you? Right? And so one of the things that we were taught is how to keep everything really tight, how to keep everything just, just you know, pressure points and all that as little as possible. Basically moving the person on, getting their principal out of the way, and going, right? You just hurt them a little, you hurt them a little bit to back them the hell off, and then you get your principal to disengage your situation, and you go about your day. Right, your principal is safe. That is your actual job, and they're not going to get sued for a million dollars later. Think about this when we talk about cybersecurity, because so many new cybersecurity professionals, they don't give a damn how much damage they do to their company. Right, as as long as they're following the book. They're like, oh, it's that's bad. Um, 
things to be thinking about when you're dealing with uh, cybersecurity is what does your environment look like? Not does what not what the book says, not what your peers are working at. When you go and you drink beer and somebody's talking about their company, right? You're not working for their company. You're working for your company. What does your company look like? No environment looks like a college exam. Again, when you talk about what does your environment look like, what does the physical building look like, right? Do you have a place for a server room? Do you have a place in order to do certain things for cybersecurity? What are the resources? What are the financial resources that you have? Uh, what is the education of your particular user base? All of these different types of things. These are things that you have to be thinking about when you implement your particular cybersecurity policies. Um, again, best, best practices don't last 30 seconds in the real world. Uh, one of the best examples that I ever give is um, when I was in the corporate world, uh, we had the Pittsburgh office. So I went off to the Pittsburgh office for my first time. And again, I'm a, I'm a new fancy, you know, MCSE. I know, I know what's what. And so I go there and building out, you know, fixing everything up. And then I realize, oh my golly, oh my golly, right? The server room, the server room has mop buckets in it. Oh, that's not right. They say not to do that in the book. When you're going to have a server room, you have a server room that's dedicated to your electronic and technology equipment. It has a, it has a door. It has a keyed lock, blah, blah, blah. That's how you do it, right? So I go in. I look at our server room. There's a mop bucket. There's bleach. There's ammonia. Ooh, this is definitely not by the book. So I go... <clears throat> I go up to the general manager. I like this, this is unacceptable. As a technology professional for for this uh, this uh, region of the company, I just, I just cannot abide by the uh, the server uh, the server being in the same room as the mop buckets. And I still remember the general manager looking at me. And see, this is the difference between noobs. The difference between noobs and people that've been in the job for a long time is how they come to the situation. Like noobs are all like. Arr! Like people have been around for a long time, they just kind of sit, sit back. <laughs> like, oh, is that the case, Eli? And so I remember the general manager looked at me. He's like, well, here's the thing, Eli. I, I, I need a utility closet. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, I have only been in this building as general manager for three years now. But I have yet to discover uh, another uh, utility closet in this building. So Eli, Eli, just as soon, if, when you find the hidden utility closet, I will be more than happy to move all the mop buckets and everything out of your, else out of your server room. Uh, but, but until then, I need some place to put my mop buckets. <laughs> like, uh-oh. Right? And again, this is what you have to think about. There's so many technology people, they hyper-focus on what they think. They hyper-focus on their ego. They're not thinking about the rest of the company. They're not thinking about the warehouse manager, the operation manager, the general manager, the, you know, the division, blah, blah, blah. All of you, everybody has their own priorities and things. And again, when you come in, you got to figure out where the hell you slot into this mess. One of the big things that I always say is focus on what you can fix now. All right, again, the big thing, you walk in, you're like, oh my God, I know, I know how it is. You walk in, you're like, what the hell? Here's the thing, you can't fix it all in a day. Rome was neither built nor torn down in a day. You're, you're not going to do everything in a day. So one of the big things that you need to be doing when you come into a new situation where you see a lot of cybersecurity problems, the whole nine yards, is you walk in the door, figure out what problems you can solve now, and then start solving those problems. As you solve those problems, you're going to learn more about the infrastructure, you're going to learn more how the company works, and then you're going to be able to figure out another problem, then another problem, then another problem, then another problem, then another problem. When you walk into a server room and it's a rat's nest, right? It's a rat's nest and Active Directory isn't configured properly and firewalls aren't configured properly and updates haven't been done and, 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 right? First thing to do, you walk in, okay, rat's nest. I know, I, I don't need an MCSE, I don't need a college degree to clean up all the wiring uh, in, my, in my, uh, my server room. You go in, you clean up all the wiring, you make sure it's good, anything that's unplugged, anything that's not actually being used, you put it to a side, anything that, that is blinking, <laughs> 
you make sure you know what the hell it actually is and if it's still being used. If it's not still being used, you power that down, you remove it from the racks, you go through, you clean everything up. Once you've cleaned everything up, then you start going to all of the user's computers and you start updating, you know, doing Windows updates, antivirus updates, all of those kinds of things. Once you finish that, then oh golly, you make sure your backup systems are working properly and then you go try to update your servers. <laughs> Hope that doesn't go horribly, right? There's all these things you can slowly, 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 slowly do. And as you're doing that, you're learning about your environment. You're learning about the situation. You're creating trust with all of the other uh, partners that you have, the users, the executives, everything else. You're getting to understand the vendors. And then as you go, it makes it a lot easier to be able to solve these larger and larger problems. So the big thing is don't, don't lose your mind off of one. <laughs> Fix what you can fix. F fix what you can currently fix and then keep going. Again, that's one of the big things with the executives. Whether it's the executives or whether it's the users, if you come in and every day or every week your infrastructure starts functioning better, they're going to start liking you a lot more. They're going. Everybody is going to be a hell of a lot more agreeable for whatever you're asking if they have a couple of months, if every week the systems are running better, so that when you come in and you tell the, uh, the CEO you need some new server, they are more likely to say yes to that purchase. When you come in and you, see, you say you need to uh, create more security policies to lock down the user's computers, the users are going to be less likely to push back because they're going to realize you are trying to help them out. If you walk in from day one and you say, oh, the security policies are ridiculous, and you start locking down everybody's systems, <laughs> nobody's going to like you. <laughs> it's got to be a lot worse. Um, and then one of the big things, too, is for your environment, is something to be thinking about is plan for the future. Again, a lot of times when you walk into an environment, there's a lot of mess that's been installed. The legacy, like the, 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 horror, the horror word for a lot of people in the IT is legacy systems, right? You're going to walk in and there's all kinds of nastiness there. So one of the things to be thinking about is how can you plan for the future, right? If you've got, you know, Windows Active Directory servers and all that kind of thing, one of the, think, one of the things to think about is like, okay, well, these are, these are five-year-old Active Directory servers. These are not virtualized. So let's start planning for the future. When we do the next, when we do the next, you know, migration or whatever in the next year, we are going to migrate to a virtualized infrastructure with high availability. So if there is a physical box failure, uh, the services stay up and running for all of our users, right? And that's one of the things you just you just plan for. And then you start talking to the CEOs, you start talking with people about what you plan to do, why you plan to do it, what the costs will be, what the benefits will be, the whole nine yards. And then you can start you can start building the security in as as you go and again it's a lot easier to, to pay for security when you're just kind of doing the normal refresh cycle right if, if your CEO knows every five years you're gonna upgrade the servers and it just comes to that five-year point anyway and they're like okay we're gonna upgrade the servers and then you say ah this time I would like to go to this type of infrastructure and again it might cost a little bit more but the executive is already expecting to pay money so you just do your sales pitch on why spending a little bit more money makes a hell of a lot more sense and it'll be a lot easier right if you're if you're three years into a five-year refresh cycle and all of a sudden you start talking about spending ten or twenty thousand dollars on new servers and the CEO is like wait a minute then we just spend ten or twenty thousand dollars on new servers that's gonna be a lot harder sell so again with this whole focus on what you can fix now is you're going to have a lot of stuff coming up in refresh cycles, right? Uh, so client computers are going to come up in refresh cycles. So when those client computers come up, you know, get them updated and make sure they're, they're more secure. Your network working equipment, how old is that? It's probably going to be really easy to go to your executive and go, look, our networking equipment, you know, 10, 15 years old, some of the stuff at this point is, we really just need to normally upgrade it. And when we do, I want to buy equipment that has this security stuff built in. You start doing that, all of that stuff is going to take time and it's going to be amazing, right? Those servers that are really annoying you, by the time you get all of this other work done, then the you know, servers will be ready for the refresh cycle and you can go and flip them out relatively easy too. So this is one of the big things to, to really be thinking about. Again, your environment, your particular situation. And then how, how are you going to befriend everybody? How are you going to get buy-in from everybody so that they trust you so you can just do your darn job? Um, again, along this is, uh, is building trust. 
Building trust is the biggest thing. Here's the thing, your CEO is never gonna understand Active Directory. And let's be honest, you're probably never gonna understand asset depreciation now, are you? Again, that's a whole big thing, right? You know, technology professionals come in, <laughs> users, users just don't understand. Uh, they think Active Directory is magic. They think VPNs are magic. Software has us. Can you, can you believe the CFO? The CFO wants us to use Office 365. They want our stuff in the cloud. That's ridiculous, right? One, one, of, the, one of the big problems with tech people is, again, they, they, they think they're the most important person in the company. Do you, do you understand the accounting practices for your company? Do you understand the legal uh, environment your company works in? Do you understand all of the, the ins and outs of your company? If the CEO, the chief operations officer of your company fell over dead tomorrow, could you just hop into their job and do their job? Because you're so smart, right? You're an IT person, you're a tech person. You're so brilliant and you know the most important things of the company. Couldn't you just go into their job and do whatever it is that they do? Of course not. <laughs> Of course not, right? Again, when you come to a company, you don't really understand what the CEO is up to. You don't really understand what the CFO is up to. You don't really understand what the COO is up to. And half the time, you have no idea what the warehouse people are doing, right? But the same is true with them. The same thing is true with them, right? A company is having a lot of different highly skilled people all hyper-focused on whatever their niche is, trying to make that as best as possible so the entire organization can grow. So one of the big things to understand is you don't really have to have your CEO understand uh, Active Directory. You don't have to have your C CFO really understand databases or any of that kind of thing. One of the most important things is that they trust you. It's not that they trust the systems. It's not that they trust the vendor. That they trust you. When you walk in and you go, look, we've been talking about X, Y, or Z for a couple of months now. Look, I haven't been pushing, pushing or anything else. I understand we got budgetary issues and all that kind of stuff. But look, we are at the drop dead point. If we do not do this upgrade now, everything is going to fail. I need you to cut a check. Right? That's what the sales pitch is really going to be. And you need them to look at you. <clears throat> Probably say some nasty words. They're going to say some nasty words. It's just how the world is. And then they're going to write you a check. Again, it's like, you know, it's things like, uh, right back in the old days, like, like uh, client access licenses, cows are always a bugger, right? You're dealing with a company. At some point, they purchase a ridiculous number of cows, and then they just expected those things to last forever. And all of a sudden, you're going like, hey, we need, you know, 50 more cows for all of our users. Why, why do I, we have to write this check? Because <laughs> you employed 15 more people. <laughs> User cow, user cow, user cow. You you hired a uh, fifty more people. We need fifty cows. Again, getting the whole argument about what a cow is or not is a whole big thing. You need them to trust you, and part of it, part of that, part of that trust process is also you knowing when the hell to back off. When is it not worth winning the fight? When is it not worth continuing the argument? When should you shut the hell up? <laughs> walk away and solve whatever problem that you actually can solve that day, right? If you walk in acting as if everything is World War III, it's that whole, you know, the, the, the person who cried wolf, the kid who cried wolf or whatever, at a certain point, nobody's going to give a damn about anything that you say. Again, a lot of this is about you creating trust, and that creating trust is you creating a relationship with the people around you. Um, remember, ex executives are juggling numerous priorities. Acting like an ass will not help your cause. Right? You come in saying, I'm the most important thing in the world, and they've got a dozen other issues going on. That's a big problem. Uh, you need to build people's trust in you. They need to trust you, not what you advise. Again, words coming out of your mouth. Who the hell? They, they don't understand that. You're right. You're right. They're so stupid. It's so stupid. They don't even understand what you're talking about. You're right. It's pantomime, it's acting. You say words, they say words, we say words together. Yeah, you have a smart person over there and you're a smart person, you all kind of say words at each other. Again, it's the interesting part about uh, communication. Again, as an Aspie, as an Aspie, human com communication is fascinating to me. And, and how you realize that communication actually works. Sometimes, sometimes you say words at each other just because you're supposed to say words at each other. And then, and then either you get the go ahead or you get the no go based on whether or not they trust you. Hey, this person said we need to do this. 
fine, we're gonna do it, right? It's not necessarily the words that come out of your mouth. Uh, and, and, I know, oh, the horror here. Office politics is part of your job. Lots of exclamation marks and a couple of more exclamation marks. Again, especially in the technology world, technology professional. Oh, can't, office politics. I can't, I can't believe some of those people doing office politics. Really? You can't believe that they're doing their job? <laughs> you, you can't believe they're doing what they're actually supposed to be doing? Right, again, in, in these environments, these are social environments, office politics, right? It's about creating relationships. It's about creating, uh, you know, conversation. It's about creating, you know, doing bonding and all that kind of stuff. Office politics is incredibly important. You don't have to like it. You don't have to appreciate it, but again, the people around you are. If you know the, the, the people's pets' names, if you know their kids are playing in lacrosse, if you know their mother just died, right? If somebody's mother just died and you walk in with a small bouquet of flowers and you put it on their desk, <laughs> that is going to make you getting a new server go so much easier. Right again, that's one of the things. A lot of a lot of tech people, they don't they don't put together a small bouquet of flowers and you know a fifty thousand dollar server migration and how those are connected. They are very integrally connected, right? This person, you know, look, our cybersecurity person, our technology person, they care about the people around them. They care about the company. They are trying to do X, Y, or Z. So if they think this is what we need, we are going to give them what they need, right? Again, that whole, that whole communication, hey, hey, look, man, you know, when we, when we were out doing whatever, you know, you, you know how I am, uh, okay, fine. Office politics is a huge thing, and that's part of building trust. Now, when we go into this, uh, one of the big things to be thinking about, again, some people right now, I'm talking about IT, I'm talking about Active Directory servers, I'm talking about some of this stuff, and they're like, <laughs> This is a cybersecurity. I thought I thought Eli was going to be talking about cybersecurity, and he's talking about server migrations and client computer refresh cycle. <laughs> this isn't a real cybersecurity class. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But here's the thing: cybersecurity, all cybersecurity is, is good administration. If you do your administration properly. By default, you have good cybersecurity. <laughs> Most of the issues that we are seeing in the modern world is there is crap administration, and then hackers compromise the hell out of that, that crap administration, right? When you are building your infrastructure, again, we'll, we'll talk about this with layered security and the rest of it in a little bit. When you're building your infrastructure, you should be administering your infrastructure based on any number of potential hazards uh, against your system. You should be uh, creating systems based off of what happens if, if your building floods, what happens if your building is in the middle of a wildfire what happens if your building is hacked what happens if if your uh, your storage array literally melts itself that happens every once in a while right there's all these things that you need to be thinking about for the integrity the resiliency of your infrastructure and if you design things properly you have good cybersecurity all right again it's, it's like when we talk about ransomware right now ransomware Here's the thing, we can get into this whole thing with cybersecurity and having forensic, you know, malware detectives, you know, malware engineers come in and pick apart, you know, the malware. And again, that's real, that's real. Um, but here's the thing to understand, right? Is if you have a good disaster recovery solution, if you have good backups and all that kind of thing, whether, whether a tornado takes your server away or whether a hacker uh, encrypts all the data on your server, Wipe and reload. Wipe, reload, put the data back, and, and you should be going again, right? When you look at the ransomware attacks, the, 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 the issue with the ransomware attacks is not that the database got encrypted. <laughs> that's its own pain in the ass. That's its own problem. But, but that should be relatively easy to solve. When you see a ransomware attack take down a company, just realize that means their systems were vulnerable against anything that would have gone after that data. If a tornado would have come through, the same situation. If their, if their data array would have failed, the same situation. Anything that would have destroyed their data, they would be in the exact same position. Because, because they got attacked by ransomware, then they can cry. 
die, and then they can talk about the hackers, and then they can say, oh, what is the world turning into? I don't know what the world is turning into, because all these lazy-ass administrators that aren't doing their damn job to begin with really is the problem, right? But again, it's a big, it's a big thing to be thinking about when you're, when you're building out all of your stuff, is cybersecurity should be part of it. A lot of the stuff when you see cybersecurity, again, when you when you you know you're you're reading the the college uh, the college syllabuses and all that kind of stuff you hear about like forensic investigators and you hear this really like this really cool stuff when they're talking about cybersecurity and to be clear to be clear that that that's that's not false that's not wrong right there there are there are forensics there are there are people that, that basically rip viruses apart rip malware apart to understand how those things function you have to understand though that those people they're they're a niche within the cybersecurity world most of the problems that we're dealing with with cybersecurity, we don't need to know those things. Again, if you, if you start if you start trying to solve for cl entire classes of problems, then it doesn't really, really matter how the malware works, right? So if, if, if somebody, if there's a spear phishing attack and somebody sends a virus to your CEO, and here's the thing, if your CEO is able to double click on that virus <laughs> and it goes attacks your system, it doesn't really matter how that virus was made. It doesn't really matter what the, the engineering of that virus was. The, fail, the failure was that there were security policies on that particular computer that allowed anybody to, to click anything willy-nilly and have it run rampant over your systems. Again, a lot of the stuff with, uh, you, know, you know, you look at ransomware, one of the big problems is if you have administrators logged in as global administrators for their domain, <laughs> and they double click on something stupid, what they just double clicked on now has the privileges of whoever is currently logged into the system, which means if it's a global domain administrator, <laughs> they have access to your entire domain. Again, you don't necessarily need a forensic engineer to, to figure out what's going on there. So security should be built into the infrastructure, and this is something you should be thinking about. Again, we talk about high availability, security policies, you know, firewalls, all this kind of stuff. It should just be built in. Um, security should be a layered thing. Any single layer compromise should not be a killer, right? So a lot of these things, you know, you hear about the whole deal. You know, if a global, you know, system administrator password is, is out in the wild, or if there's any single vulnerability, um, and hackers go after that sinker vulnerability. One of the things you need to be thinking about with your, your, your infrastructure when you're building it out with a cybersecurity mindset is that your security should be layered in such a way that even if somebody has a global system uh, administrator, username, and password, that is not actually valuable to them. Right? And that's the thing you should be thinking about. How can you create your systems so that they're so secure, even if somebody has a root level username and password, that it's basically worthless? Again, if SSH is not accessible from the outside world, even if somebody has that, that root, 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 uh, root uh, username and password, if you can't SSH in, it doesn't matter. Even if you're doing administrative things out from the outside world, somebody has you know username and password, if you're locking things based off of things like IP address, again, some, like a very simple thing in the cybersecurity world right now, you can get this for either Linux or Windows, is there's actual just simple IP geo-blocking mechanisms. So basically, whenever anybody, anybody tries to access your server, it will grab the IP address, it looks at a database to, what the, to see what the geographic location of that IP address is, and then it can either you know, whitelist or blacklist, basically allow or deny uh, that user coming in based based off of what the IP address is or what the geolocation of the IP address is, right? So if you have a company, and even if you're remote working, um, all of your people are in a state. So let's say I'm in North Carolina right now. So all of your all of your administrators are working from home. They are VPNing in to do administrative tasks, simply doing something like putting IP geoblocking on. So, simp so simply, nobody who has an IP address that's outside of North Carolina uh, can get into the systems, right? That, that's just a simple way of, of doing security. Again, it's the whole thing, like if, if, if there's a spear phishing attack and somebody double clicks on a particular uh, uh, virus or malware that comes in, if they double click and you have good security policies though, so that, 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 that executable is not able to run, then everything fails out. Again, even if you even if you double click on a virus, if there's if you're not if you, your account doesn't have permissions to run havoc on the infrastructure, 
then again, you're not going to have the same problems. So one of the things you need to be thinking about, this is where we talk about, you know, you need to think about firewall, you know, firewalls, security policies, patch management, IP address banning, all of these things come together to give you your overall security infrastructure. And you should be looking at, you should be looking at it to such a degree, could I freaking write the, the global, you know, domain administrator, username and password, could I put that on a billboard somewhere and be fine? I'm not saying do that. That would be kind of stupid. But hey, you get what I'm saying. There, there was that guy, uh, I don't know, it was the identity protection guy, and he was putting his, he literally put his own social security number on billboards. I probably want to go that far, but, you know, it's a mental exercise. That's what you should be going for. When you think about security in the modern world, one of the things you need to be thinking about is that we are now in zero trust environments. Uh, so this is a big change from the old days. The old days, again, 2000, uh, relatively high trust environments. So back in the old days, you would have your Windows um, uh, domain controllers, uh, you would have your Windows clients, uh, you would have the printers on your network, uh, and the whole nine yards, right? Computers were expensive, nobody had smartphones. Smartphones didn't exist back in 2000, or whatever the degree, we, the degree we had today. And wireless, I still remember when wireless came out, and so that was a thing. Every single computer had to be hardwired into the network. Every computer that was hardwired into the network, you had to actually make a member of the domain. Everybody had domain user accounts with security policy, and the whole nine yards, and so you had a pretty trusted environment, right? You didn't, you didn't, you didn't have to worry about a lot of firewalls. You didn't really have to worry a lot about layering your networks. You didn't really have to worry about uh, being too paranoid about your internal infrastructure, right? You, you put firewalls. You, you put you put some kind of security between your your LAN and the outside world. That generally was good enough. Again, antivirus and that kind of stuff. But inside the network wasn't wasn't that big a deal. Uh, the issue that we came to, uh, and this was actually 10, 12 years ago at this point, is BYOD. Bring your own device. <laughs> oh, that was that was a bad day for system administrators. <laughs> That was bad, bad, bad. So what BYOD was, all these executives out there, all these executives and these users, they had this great idea. Hey, if all of our employees are spending all of their own money on smartphones and tablets and all these kind of weird ass, you know, wireless and computer devices, why don't we just allow them to use those devices on our network, right? Why should I, as a CEO, spend a thousand dollars to buy all my salespeople iPhones when they're just gonna buy iPhones anyway, right? If I don't have to buy 50 iPhones, that's fifty thousand dollars. My company doesn't have to spend on iPhones, so we're just gonna let them use their devices on our network. That was BYOD. Smartphones, all kinds of smartphones, all kinds of tablets, the whole nine yards. You are now bringing in devices, and now you're bringing things like laptop computers and all that kind of stuff that haven't, they haven't gone through the vetting process uh, of the, the IT department. Uh, they haven't had their, you know, fresh, you know, wipes and reloads, making sure that they're, they're up to, to corporate specifications. Basically, any Yahoo is bringing their computer in off the street, connecting to the network, and now that little device can see your Active Directory server, your Exchange server, your SharePoint server, your DHCP and DNS and all that kind of stuff. And that, that was the day everything started to go very badly. Uh, with BYOD, we have, we have moved even past this now, so a lot of people like to buy their own computers at this point, because they want whatever particular computer they want to use. And now with those computers, again, computers can get infected with viruses, you get back to malware, the whole nine yards, right? So I'm at home, I'm well, not me, Yahoo, user, user is at home, gets bored one night, starts looking at porn sites, their computer gets infected with all kinds of crap, they then bring their computer into the internal network, plug it in so they can start printing and getting their email and everything else, and now you've just got this nasty little cancerous, you know, thing of a computer sitting inside your network. And so that's where we are now in a zero trust environment. When you are building out your infrastructure, you should build your infrastructure to, in such a way that nothing trusts anything else. 
And my, <laughs> you never know which one of these things got all infected with porn or whatever else. But when you design for a zero trust environment, this is going to be entirely different. Again, it's about putting servers, uh, you know, uh, with firewalls between servers. They're basically like in the old days, you might have your database server and your web server. They're basically sitting side by side. And logically, they're basically sitting side by side and they can communicate all willy nilly who the hell cares, right? Nowadays, one of the things you need to be thinking about is how the connections are done. Again, if you have a web server, all it's doing is web thing, then for any, anybody on the local subnet, they should only be able to access that web server on port 80, right? That web server should only be able to access the database server on whatever specific ports that database server needs. That database server shouldn't have SSH open just willy-nilly. Uh, you should not be able to remote desktop into the, the IIS server, the web server. Right? You need to you need to start thinking about what how do you build an infrastructure when you can, literally can't trust anything on the network. And again, this gets even worse when we start looking at Raspberry Pis. You start looking at uh, people be, being able to bring in devices and plug them into the network, and you know try to do uh, you know network scanning and all that kind of stuff. The the fact of the matter is at this point you cannot trust your own network, nor can you trust any devices on your own network. So how are you going to build your infrastructure for that? Again, we start thinking about this with things like. Uh, remote workers, right? How do you how do you really build an infrastructure when you have all these remote workers? And one of the benefits of going to something like Office 365 is that even if a hacker compromises an account on Office 365, there, there's no full-fledged exchange server to actually compromise. So one of the hacks is currently going on. You know, supposedly the Russians are doing it. Who the hell knows? Uh, is basically all these hackers are going after exchange servers. So not only are the, the email accounts and all that kind of stuff vulnerable, but the server itself is vulnerable. If you're having people VPN into your infrastructure, they're then able to access the exchange server just as if they're on the local network. Again, are you sure you can trust all of these people coming in and can they compromise something like your exchange server? So that's where you start building, you start thinking, okay, if we have all these remote workers, how are we going to build for these remote workers? Maybe we need to go off to Office 365 uh, in order to do our email services. Basically, uh, you know, limit the amount of damage that can be done even if a single account is hacked. Again, we talk about things like remote workers. When people are VPNing into your network, do you have geo blocks? Can somebody in China, if you're a, a North Carolina company, and all your employees are North Carolina, can somebody from China log into your VPN server? <laughs> Think about it. I bet you the answer is yes. The next question is why? Why? Right? Uh, you need to start thinking about, about that kind of thing. Again, with remote workers too, if somebody loses their password, if they lose access, anything like that, you need to be thinking about the security policies of how, how does somebody go about actually resetting a password. And then one of the big problems in uh, the modern world too is this idea of convergence. So convergence was a cool new thing about 15 years ago. Uh, back in the old days, telephone systems used their own uh, basically communications infrastructure. Surveillance systems used their own communications infrastructure. Uh, computers obviously used you know, uh, TCP IP, their own communications infrastructure. Access control systems use their own communications infrastructure, right? Uh, telephones use CAT3. Uh, surveillance cameras use coax cable. Um, access control systems used a 12 volt, usually. Uh, and then, you know, you got CAT5. All different things. Well, we have this idea of convergence. The idea of convergence is, well, can't all of these devices use TCP IP? Can we put them on the IP stack? And so now we have a voice over IP cameras. We have IP, uh, or we have voice over IP telephones. We have IP cameras. We have other IP-based access control systems and everything else. <laughs> Here's the problem. Here's a problem. I got a question for you. Question? Question from the SP in the back. Um, what is your patch management solution for the hundreds of these, what we call IoT devices that are on your network. When was the last time you upgraded the software on your Polycom IP phones? When was the last time you upgraded the firmware on all of your surveillance cameras? Here's an interesting question. <laughs> do you even know how to do it? <laughs> do you even know if you could upgrade uh, basically the, the software on all these different little IoT devices if you decided to actually do it. 
And so one of the big problems we have right now is this is where we see is, is these are, you know, telephones and uh, surveillance cameras and all that. These are servers. These are servers. If you actually look at them, they're, they're literally Linux servers. When you can go to an IP address and you can pull up a web page that shows you the configuration information for whether it's a voice over IP telephone or whether it's a surveillance camera, that shows you it's literally a server. It's literally a server. It has some kind of either Apache, some kind of, you know, um, Oh, web page, you know, server software on there. It has a configurations, has a networking stack, it has a whole thing, right? If that can get compromised somehow, that is now a little node in a hacking network that can cause all kind of kinds of havoc on your internal infrastructure. And so, one of the questions that you need to be asking yourself is how 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 can you prevent attacks from your internal surveillance cameras if they get compromised? Again, uh, we think about this with a more complicated attacks against infrastructure. So, I I have my little computer. Well, not me. Somebody that's not me. I go home. I look at a lot of porn. I then get infected with something. But let's say I don't get infected with something obvious. Right? That's one of the problems in the security world. Right? When it's obvious, when my, when my computer starts launching uh, pop-up ads, when my computer won't do certain things, that's obvious. What if I get something infected with something that's not obvious? What if I get infected with some kind of virus that is simply looking for D-Link uh, surveillance cameras from 2010? All right, let's say, let's say I'm, I'm not saying that there is. I, I think there was, but don't quote me. Let's say D-Link had surveillance cameras in 2010. They may not even do surveillance cameras anymore. So what if you get infected with software or, or a virus? Literally all it does is it scans whatever internal network it's on, looks for these D-Link devices, and then if it finds a D-Link device, it tries to compromise it in a way that the hackers understand that it can be compromised. Right? These are the kinds of things that you need to be thinking about. And then how, how can you prevent problems going into the future? It's a zero trust environment. Do not trust anything. Again, again, distrust, verify, stay suspicious with everything, with literally everything. Um, one of the big things you need to be thinking about, uh, again, when you're in the business environment and you're starting to do cybersecurity, is getting the decision maker buy-in. That's the most important thing, right? You, you, can have, you can have the best reasons in the world. You can be the smartest guy in the room, girl in the room, whatever. Uh, but if the CEO or the CFO doesn't want to write you a check, it doesn't matter. That's what it comes down to a lot of times. A lot of times it comes down to office politics. Did you buy them a little bouquet of flowers when their dog died? <laughs> It's gonna matter for when, when you need to buy new servers or new firewalls or whatever else. Uh, one of the big things to be thinking about is preventive maintenance is a hard sell. Uh, this isn't just in the business world, this is everywhere. One of the problems you see in the US right now, so the US, we built a lot of infrastructure years ago, roads, pipelines, railways, the whole nine yards, uh, and it's falling apart. Where in China, right now, they're building a lot of brand new things. Well, here's the interesting thing. Again, it's just a psychological deal. If you ask somebody to spend money to buy brand new cool things, it's a lot easier. Getting people to spend money, basically to make the thing that they already purchased continue to function, is a lot more difficult. Uh, it was interesting. I had, a, I had a friend of mine who actually ran, ran a uh, oh an auto repair uh, business, and one of the biggest problems he had was convincing people to change their oil and do preventive maintenance. Right, because again, if your car if your car is running fine, why am I going to spend two hundred dollars or whatever getting my radiator flushed? My car is running fine. Well, that's how you feel <laughs> until everything fails, right? So one of the things you need to be thinking about is preventive maintenance is always going to be a hard sell. Um, so think about again when you're going through the sales process, how can you add security to the normal upgrades and purchases? Right? Again, as I said before, you know you've got a refresh cycle on your servers, you know the refresh cycle is going to come up in a certain amount of time. When that refresh cycle comes up, that is the time to be saying, hey, why don't we go over to the, this high availability failover? Or hey, why don't get, we get this additional software so we can have disaster recovery as a service? When we buy the server, I'm going to spec out the server based off of 
everything we've needed in the past, plus all of these additional things. It's a hell of a lot easier, right? If you already have to buy a $10,000 server, convincing the CEO to spend another couple of thousand dollars for the additional security or whatever uh, reliability things is actually a hell of a lot easier way to go. And this, this is one of the ways you can do this rel relatively painlessly is where you just keep, you keep walking through the process. And every time you see something, you just upgrade here, upgrade here, upgrade here, upgrade here. In a few years, you actually got a good infrastructure. I know some people out there, Eli, that's going to be a few years. Yeah, it's going to take a while. <laughs> you, do all under, you, you do all understand we actually get paid for doing something, right? It takes a while. Just doing everything. Auditing takes a while. Upgrades take a while. Patch management takes a while. You, you go into a business, especially if you've got thousands of computers, just getting them all up to spec in any amount of time, it's going to be difficult. Uh, one of the big things, too, is that uh, CEOs are like everybody else. Co CEOs like cool schnizzle. It's going to be family friendly around here. Schnizzle. Schnitzel. Schnizzle. Uh, one of the things to be thinking about when you're selling security things to your CEOs is, you know, a 100 inch LCD screen showing you know, real time security dashboards might be a hell of a way to uh, sell your product. Again, one of the big problems we have as technology professionals is that if you don't really understand what's going on, it is incredibly difficult to visualize what it is we're doing, right? A lot of what technology professionals do is we understand what's going on and we literally map stuff in our own minds to understand logically what's happening. Again, the whole idea of what is, what is the physical environment versus what is the logical environment, all this kind of stuff we're very used to. The problem is, is again, if people don't really understand what's going on to begin with, it's very hard for them to visualize it. And so many times it's very hard to sell a concept, sell what you're doing. So one of the things to understand is for CEOs and executives, and all that kind of stuff. If you can visualize or if you can create visualizations for them, a lot of times it might be a hell of a lot easier to sell things in the future. So one of the things I think about, like I got this, I got the Hisense, Hisense. I got this for like less than $600. This is a 65 inch screen I got for less than uh, $600, right? Uh, you can get an 85 inch, 2021, it's probably less whenever you're watching this. 2021, you can get an 85 inch 4K LCD or LED, LED, I suppose, LED screen for less than $1,500. So one of the things to be thinking about with all the upgrades and purchases and all that kind of stuff is you can probably shove $1,500 somewhere into the budget somewhere. And if your executive walks in to your network department or whatever else, and you have an 85 inch or maybe multiple 65 inch screens that really for your corporation don't cost a lot of money. And on them, you have real time visualizations of what's going on with your infrastructure and possibly security problems and all that kind of stuff. It makes it a hell of a lot easier to sell things <laughs> to your CEO. Um, you know, sometimes you got to sell the sizzle <laughs> to get to the steak, right? Zig Ziglar used to say, sell, say that you don't sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. Sell the sizzle, not the steak. And so, it's something times to realize with executives and all that is that you are selling the sizzle. Do you remember a lot of CEOs, a lot of executives? They came from the ranks of salespeople, right? They're out there, they're schmoozing, they're they're. They're get, you know creating pie in the sky stores and go in order to, to get people to buy products, right? A lot of a lot of what they do is pomp and circumstance. Again, salespeople. I don't really like dealing with salespeople, especially real professional salespeople. We just don't look at the world the same way because a lot of what they do is pomp, right? I'm I'm gonna close these sales so I can get a fancier car to prove to my neighbors how fancy I am. I'm going to build a fancier house so I can prove to somebody how fancy I am. Yeah, I don't know if you actually know me in the real world. Don't get me wrong, I like my art. But again, I buy my art and then it goes in my house. I don't give a damn if you see my art. Don't care, right? It's, it's psychological. It's not, I, I don't work that way. But a lot, of, a lot of these folks do. Again, getting the fancier car. Think about that. Um, when I worked in the IT world, uh, we had a director, and it was one of the funny stories where the director had been driving around with BMW. So this was 20 some odd years ago. So BMWs, you know, they're a bit more, you know, they're fancy, considered fancy than they are today. I guess Mercedes is cooler today. Anyways, BMWs were cool. So so he was driving as a director, he was director, you know, he was driving around his BMW, and he was feeling all good being driving around his BMW. And then one of the salespeople, one of the salespeople uh, in the department uh, did really good. And so the salesperson felt really good about themselves, and they went out and bought a BMW. Mm-hmm. 
Real story. So they they buy their brand new BMW. They park it by the uh, the director's couple year old BMW, and the next day the director came in with a Jaguar. <laughs> not a joke. <laughs> not a joke. God darn it! I am not gonna drive the same car as my salespeople. Uh, again, you, you can snark about it. Again, I'm not I'm not here about the politics. I'm not here about all that kind of stuff. I, I'm here about the reality. Right, so sometimes, right, with CEOs and executives, you know, it's a little, it's a lot of, a little bit of pissing contest. Like my company is so cool, my department is so cool. Oh wow, well, you know, we just hired the cyber this, this this person. You know, they're they're really focused on cybersecurity. Oh yeah, you 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 go you go into our operations center. Yeah. Again, you take a crappy conference room nobody's using anyway, you turn it into an operations center. Oh, yeah, you walk in that operations center. He's got screens up on there, real-time tracking everything that's going on. I mean, like when, I walk, when I walk into that operations center, I just know, I know my company's infrastructure is just being dealt with well. I mean, I feel, I feel, I feel bad for you. I mean... <laughs> I mean, damn, I, I mean, I, I understand your company isn't doing well enough to be able to, to afford an operations center, afford an actual cybersecurity guy. <laughs> I mean, but, but some of them, I mean, some of them, we're actually still closing some sales. <laughs> pissing contests. Again, I know, I know some people watching right now, I talk about uh, office politics and pissing contests, and you're probably just getting mad at the thought, look, I'm an ass <laughs> I don't like it either. But I, I learned a long time ago, it doesn't matter what I like, uh, the reality is, the reality is a different thing. Mm. Uh, visualizing the value of tech is hard. Again, stupid gimmicks are not. Simply having that dashboard, real-time things going on, great. Um, the other thing is, know who is actually in charge. Uh, is it the CIO or the CFO? This is a big thing in the modern world. So we talk about the C-level executive, the CXO. Uh, you have the chief executive offer officer. They're considered captain of the ship. You have the COO, the chief operations officer. Uh, they deal with all the logistics stuff, shipping and that kind of thing. CMO, chief marketing officer, deal with your advertising campaigns and all that kind of stuff. You have your CIO, ob obviously, your, your chief uh, uh, information officer, your CTO, your chief technology officer. They're supposed to deal with all the technology stuff. And then you have your CFO, your chief financial officer, which is basically, you know, <laughs> Urkel. <laughs> who Urkel grew up to be, right? Sitting there with their big Coke bottle glasses, making sure all the numbers work out, right? They're, they're the accountant of the company. Yeah, they may, they may look like dorks, but they make a crap ton of money. <laughs> Anyways, one of the big things to be thinking about with, with, your, with your company, again, when we start talking about like cybersecurity and all that, is one of the questions you have to ask yourself, ask company really, is who is actually in charge of the decision making. Um, I think about this is I was talking to a uh, CIO a couple of years ago and uh, he was talking about a buddy of his where he worked for a company, basically the, the CIO for the company went to the CFO, basically asked the CFO essentially for a $50,000 check uh, in order to upgrade their exchange service. So we're talking about like three years ago or something like that. So he walks in, they're the CIO, $50,000 is a very reasonable expense for their company, just walks in, expects to get a check. CFO literally looked at the CIO and said, why aren't we using Office 365? CIO says, excuse me, that's not your call. CFO says, well, in fact, it is. And so that was the thing, the CFO looked at, again, when you look at asset depreciation, we look at taxation, look at a whole bunch of different things. If you actually purchase equipment, it gets taxed and it gets dealt with entirely different than if you purchase a service, right? So basically the CFO looked at it and said, well, look, if we go with Office 365, we pay $5 a month per user. It goes up, it goes down, depending on how many employees we currently have. Uh, since it's we're paying month to month, it gets written off entirely every single year. We don't have to do depreciation or anything like that. So we're doing Office 365. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> that's a reality check for you. And so that's something to be thinking about with your company is who is actually making the decisions in the company? Is it the CEO? Is it the CIO? Is it the CFO? Is it the oper is it chief operations officer? You may be surprised in your company who's actually making the decisions. Uh, a number of years ago, um, some some of the, the, the tech magazines, like the real tech tech publications or whatever, um, I was reading about, we're actually positing the idea that CMOs might actually take over for the CIO position. The idea that 
marketing at this point is becoming so technical uh, that essentially that the chief marketing officer would de facto take control over the technology departments going into the future. Didn't quite flesh out the way they thought it was going to, but it actually wasn't a half bad argument. Not quite the best argument out there, but it's something you don't think about. Like, what? wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what do you mean the, C the CMO could take over the IT department? But if you start looking at things, what you realize is, is the person that may actually be making the decisions for the company may not be who you think it is. So just kind of be careful with that. Um, I always think about this uh, like as a consultant where um, you know people have this idea that CEOs write the checks. And one of the lessons I learned as being a consultant is CEOs sign the checks. CEOs sign the checks. The secretary, administrative assistant, whatever the hell you want to call them, they're the ones that actually write the checks. If you actually want to sell to a company, get his ass to the secretary. That secretary is getting a big ass bouquet of flowers every birthday. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones to call you. They're going to be the ones to write the checks. They're going to be the ones to go in and convince the CEO to sign the check so that you can actually get paid. And so that's a big thing to understand in the corporate world. And again, this is why office politics matter so much because it's not necessarily as obvious as you may want it to be. Uh, and getting employee buy-in. This is the other big thing. Um, if, if the employees don't buy in to, to whatever you're deploying, security you're deploying, oh my crap, things go bad so fast. Oh, I remember back in the day, so again, when I was a consultant, and the whole blacklisting websites and whitelisting websites, that became a more prominent thing to do in uh, business networks. Oh my golly, when I started blacklisting Facebook on clients' networks. <clears throat> Oh, you should have seen some pissed off employees. <laughs> what what do you what do you mean? I can't look at Facebook while the boss is paying me a ridiculous salary. <laughs> Freedom! It really did go badly. <laughs> to be clear, to be clear, all of those blacklist filters got removed. I lost. I fought the employees and I lost. Um, and so one of the big things to be thinking about, again, when you're doing such cybersecurity, when you're talking about things like security policies, when you're talking about things such as whether or not people will be able to access, you know, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or any of that kind of thing, one of the big things is going to get the employees to buy in and coming to some compromise with the employees. Again, you think about this like with social networking. So again, for computers on the internal network, any computer that is communicating with my Active Directory server, my Exchange server, anything like that, I don't want them going out to social networking sites. I do not want them going out to YouTube. There, there's security issues with this. There's a whole bunch of issues that go along with this. On the other hand, if I flat out blacklist uh, the ability for anybody on premises to be able to access those websites, I'm going to have an employee revolt. So one of the things you might think about as a compromise is all of the internal systems, you blacklist Facebook, all these kinds of things, but then you have a guest network, you just open up a guest network, and you say, okay, your smartphone, your BYOD device, you can connect to the Wi-Fi guest network that does not is not able to access any of our internal infrastructure. And from there, if you want to watch YouTube or Facebook or whatever else, that is a management decision, right? That's one of those things you can think about as a, as a compromise, right? Training, training your employees so that they understand what's going on. One of the biggest problems when you're dealing with employees is frankly they don't they don't get it. No, they don't. They really don't get it. They are naive. Why? By golly, they are naive because nobody actually ever explained this crap to them. So one of the things to be thinking about is how, how can you do training? How can you communicate with your users so that they understand why you're trying to do the things that they're doing? Again, listening to employees, asking the employees why it is they do what they do. One of the things that you'll find out is many times the reason that the employees are doing something that's essentially breaking IT policy is because the infrastructure that's being created literally uh, doesn't allow them to do the work that they need to do. Now, again, I think about this in the corporate world, uh, uh, quotas for, uh, for mailboxes, right? Back in the days, it was like 50 megabytes, right? So we, we had executives, we had employees that uh, they would go, you know, they would be using their email. Um, whatever else, and then they would, they would max out the, the, their email box size, right? There was, a, there was a quota that was just way too small. And so since they needed, and so that was a the thing, they were violating security policies in order to do their job. So they're now using, they're now using Gmail, they're now using other communication mechanisms because they're trying to get their job done. And again, this can be one of those things to be thinking about when you come in all, you know, 
coming all big and macho, right? Telling them what's what. Again, you don't understand how pissed off these employees are going to be when they're like, look, I'm trying to get my damn job done. I'm trying to get my job done. If I don't get my job done, I'm going to get punished. The company is not giving me the resources I require in order to get my job. I went above and beyond so that I could figure out a way to get my job done. And now some 24, 25 year old little fucking snot is going to start giving me shit. <laughs> yeah, things go bad really quickly. So one of the big things is listen to employees and again, figure out if you can solve problems for them. Um, and then again, the big thing is befriend employees. Uh, have you heard me talk about relationships before? You may have never heard me say the word relationship. I, I, can, I can understand that, right? <laughs> but yes, relationships are very important. Have a relationship with everybody. It's a hell of a lot easier to get things done, right? Um, when you start looking at attacks, so again, when we actually start looking at hacking attacks and your systems getting compromised and all that kind of thing, it's important to understand you actually need three things to occur for an attack to, to actually damage your infrastructure. The first thing is you need a vulnerability, right? So basically, you need something that's vulnerable to attack. You need Java that hasn't been updated since 2002. Uh, you need a data center that's literally in a floodplain. You need, you need some kind of vulnerability that people can go after. And so this right here, that vulnerability, one of your jobs as a cybersecurity professional is trying, trying to clean up all those vulnerabilities. Patch management, update, update all of your systems, update firmware, update Java, update all these kinds of things, right? Is it, what, what is the vulnerability? The next thing you need to look at for, for an attack to actually be uh, successful is you need a vector to that vulnerability, right? So let's say you have a user account that has way too many permissions, right? You have a user account that got created, somebody gave it global, <laughs> global administrator permissions for some stupid reason, um, and it's out there, you know, you know, fancy free. Or maybe a hacker, a hacker was able to get into the system and be able to create root level root level users, right? Well, the next thing for the hacker to be able to do something is there actually needs to be a vector to that vulnerability. Can anybody from the outside world SSH you in, right? If you have a firewall to the, to, the, uh, to the internet and it simply does not allow SSH, even if somebody has a, those, those root, level permit, uh, root level username and passwords, um, they're not actually going to be able to use that, that, that vulnerability. Uh, that's one of the things we think about. Is there a vector? the attack. And then you actually have to have an attack the event, right? So you can have a vulnerability, you can have a vector, but if nobody actually mucks with your stuff, doesn't matter. This is the biggest problem right here. This is the biggest problem is so many systems and so many companies have massive vulnerabilities. They have wide open vectors. Here's the thing, nobody yet, nobody yet has attacked them, and so they don't realize how, how bad the problem is. And so that's the next thing to be thinking about, is there an actual attack or event? This is where things such as operational security is very important. So operational security is basically, does the outside world, do people know how your infrastructure operates, right? So uh, again, I was watching Network Chuck, and Network Chuck was showing, he had this little, little networking device you could plug into a switch and if you plugged it into the switch it would scan your entire network it could send out commands it could hack the hell out of your network well here's one of the things to be thinking about and this is where operational security comes in if people don't know where the hell your switches are then they're not able to plug anything into your switches Again, this is what I talked about at another cybersecurity class I was talking about this like if you if you have a if you have a networking closet, you know, you, you, put a, you put a sign for the bathroom, female bathroom, and then you put out of order on it. If people don't know where your networking equipment is, then they can't actually try to go after your networking equipment. It makes the hack a hell of a lot more difficult. And so one of the things, that, that's one of the things you need to be thinking about there, is how, how can you decrease the visibility of your infrastructure? So even if somebody wanted to go at, well, even if there is a vulnerability, and even if there's a legitimate vector, the attacker just doesn't know what, what the hell to go after. They don't know whether you use Azure, whether you use AWS, whether you use Linode, whether you use some kind of internal network, that type of thing. And so if you can block any of this kind of stuff, you can, you can block uh, most attacks. Uh, one of the big problems you run into in the cybersecurity world is the whole, <laughs> it's play the game. Is it a vulnerability or is it a feature? 
Um, you know, one of the things I think about, again, I got a, a degree in criminal justice way back when. Um, I was in one of my like, terrorism class or something like that. I remember the professor told us, he was like the safest airplane, because we were talking about hijacking incidents and all that. And he said, the safest airplane is the airplane you pull into a hangar, you lock the door on, and then you never fly. If an airplane never leaves the ground, it can never crash. And you're like, well, yeah, but again, that's a problem in the real world. If you actually want your airplanes to fly, then they might crash, then they might get hijacked. And so one of the big questions to ask yourself is basically how can you decrease the threat of that kind of event actually happening? One of the big problems we have in the IT world is that our systems are actually supposed to be used. Again, if you, if you take a computer and you unplug it and you put it into a closet, no Chinese hackers going to get their grubby little electrons on that thing, are they? It's also not going to be useful, right? An FTP server is useful because users can actually access files on it. A web server is useful because you can get a website on it. Email is useful. A server is useful because you can actually do emails and all that kind of thing. Uh, the problem is, is these servers, these systems, are designed for interactivity. And one of the big issues that you run into is all of these, all of these different types of servers. They have their vulnerabilities. FTP has vulnerability. Exchange has vulnerability. DNS can even have vulnerability. So one of the things to be thinking about is can you limit the number of features on each box that you're creating? So again, back for me, back in 2000, if you, if you bought a server, the server was so expensive, <laughs> You were running every damn service that its its RAM could handle, right? It was doing VPN, and it was doing file, and it was doing Active Directory, and it was doing IIS. It was any any feature as as long as there was enough enough RAM on that system uh, to to keep it going. Basically, you just kept adding features to that server um, and kept going. The the problem is though, right? Um, if there's a vulnerability in file sharing and Active Directory is on the same server that your file sharing server is on, then if somebody can compromise the file sharing component, then once they've comp compromised that, they can now compromise the Active Directory. If they're able to compromise the Exchange server, right? then they're able to, to, and you have file services on there, then they're able to compromise the file server. Again, if you, if you have an Exchange server that also is running your database, so, uh, oh, what was it, Office, uh, Oh, Small Business Edition? We used to sell the crap out of that. There was a server edition back in the day called um, uh, Microsoft Small Business Edition. Uh, it was up to 50 users and basically gave you Active Directory, Exchange Server, SharePoint, file services, VPN services, all the services that you could want for a small business. Reasonable fee, cost like 600 bucks. Wonderful product, wonderful product. Uh, the thing was, <laughs> Everything was on the same box. And sometimes you would add stuff, such as uh, Microsoft SQL, uh, their database uh, engine, and the whole nine yards, onto one machine. And so that's a problem. If somebody's able to compromise the Exchange server, again, we talk about ransomware attacks, they compromise the Exchange server. Once they've compromised the Exchange server, they're now on the server that hosts your database. And so then they just drop the ransomware attack in there and your life has gone to hell. So one of the things to be thinking about is can you can you separate, basically can you silo their services onto their own boxes? Uh, this may be in a virtualized environment. So you spin up Hyper-V or ESXi or whatever virtual uh, uh, solution you want, and then, okay, I have virtual Active Directory servers, and all they do is Active Directory. Nothing else. Lock everything down. Again, firewalls, everything else. All they do is Active Directory. That's an Active Directory instance. Here is our file server instance. Here is our database instance. Here is our VPN instance. Right? All of those being individual instances. So even if they get compromised, again, then the hacker has only compromised that one particular server. Another thing to be thinking about in the modern world too is that there's a lot of cheap hardware out there. So again, 10 years ago, everything was going virtualization. Again, hardware hardware is expensive, but we can now virtualize machines. One of the things to be thinking about in this, this modern world is with, uh, oh, with, with nukes, Intel nukes, next unit computers, so those small things cost a couple hundred dollars, with uh, Raspberry Pis, right? Computing devices now are very inexpensive. And so one of the things you might think about is what if you just break all these servers out into separate physical servers? Right? You know, your VPN server is running off a nuke. Your DNS server is running off of a Raspberry Pi. Your whatever else server is running off of all of these different things. Again, even if one system then gets compromised, everything else isn't taken down. I do think about this. Um, 
there is a friend of the show or whatever I've talked to a lot, um, and they they actually installed new, or they were installing nukes a couple of years, and this was a couple of years ago. They're installing nukes as servers, right? So they were actually installing them as Active Directory servers. I mean, think about it. I seven processor, sixteen to thirty two gigs of RAM. You got an NVMe drive in there. I mean. <sighs> It's only Active Directory. Active Directory was was a big thing 20 years ago. Nowadays, it's not exactly that resource intensive. And so that's something, again, how can you separate everything out? So even if one thing gets compromised, it's it's not compromising everything. Um, again, security is more than Chinese hackers. One of the problems we get into when we start talking about cybersecurity is all those Chinese or the Russians or the Russians. Apparently it's racist to, to say anything unless it's Chinese hackers or Russian hackers. If you're saying hacking, then you can then you can talk about the Chinese and Russians all you want. If you talk about anything else, then it's racist. Uh, but but the thing is, the important thing to understand when we're talking about security, is it's a hell of a lot more than Chinese hackers. No oh, darn Chinese! Um, Again, security is about what happens if a flood comes through. Security is about what happens if an employee decides to compromise your infrastructure. Security is about so many more things than those, those wily old Chinese over, over in the old old Orient or whatever the hell the, the folks want to say. Um, big thing to understand is security is a mentality, not a product. Again, so when we do further classes and we talk about antivirus and firewalls and intrusion detection, VPNs and all this kind of stuff, right? a lot of times people get hyper-focused on the product itself. This product is security. No, that the product is a product. <laughs> it's a product. VPN does something, antivirus does something, firewalls do things, intrusion detection do things, honeypots do things. These are all things that you deploy in order to solve specific cybersecurity issues, right? If you want to make sure uh, that, you know, when your user, when your employees go to a Starbucks and they're working there, they're connecting uh, to, the, to the network or whatever, you don't want people to be able to see you know, what they're sending back and forth, and then you use a VPN service. If you want to make sure people can't just randomly SSH into your servers, and then you use you know, firewalls, viruses, all that kind of stuff. But it's a mentality. You sit, you sit there and you go, okay, what problem am I solving for? What types of products solve that particular problem? And then, and then you go to Google and do a hell of a lot of research and figure out what product it is that you're actually going to purchase. But it's not a product. Uh, strategy uh, should change with time. Uh, this is a, the big thing. Again, old timers, you know, one of, one of, the, one of the, 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 the sound bites I say a lot is uh, back when I was young, I was 17 years old, I was at this uh, abandoned mall. It wasn't abandoned, it was a derelict mall. And anyway, somebody had scribbled graffiti. And what I liked, it was, what was it? I saw the greatest minds of my generation, uh, sh cold, shivering, naked in the dawn of a new age. I've been saying that phrase a lot lately. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's because I'm in the mid 40s. <laughs> I, re I remember memorizing that when I was about 17 years old. <laughs> now I'm in my mid 40s. The, 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 the meaning of it changes as you go. And one of the big things, one of the reasons I keep repeating that is basically an issue that you get in the technology world is, is a lot of people want to be important, right? Again, if you go out and get your CCIE, you go out there and get your MCSE, you go out there and get your master's degree, you go out there and get to be a CIO, it's tiring. <laughs> it's so much work. <laughs> you know, it's that whole thing like, oh, you, get, you guys get paid for doing nothing. <laughs> and you're like, what? It, it looks like we're not doing anything just because nobody's paying attention to what we do. It's like, oh, yeah, it's kind of like the rest of your life, right? You're a geek. When you were a kid, nobody was paying attention to what you did. Now you're an adult, nobody's paying attention to what you did. They just assume you're not doing anything, right? The problem is, it's, it's very hard. Get, getting to the top of your game, I mean, it's, it's hard and tiring. And the problem is, is in our career, things change a lot. Now, again, I'm not snarking on any other profession out there, but when you look at doctors, when you look at lawyers, when you look at accountants, when you look at other people that are in our kind of our league of profession, of being a professional, they get to where they are. <laughs> they do a couple of continuing education classes every year. 
and they're pretty good. They're pretty, they're pretty fine, right? I mean, that's the whole thing about being a lawyer, right? The whole idea about being a lawyer is, is once you become a lawyer, you can literally keep being a lawyer until you have a stroke, right? You can be a 90-year-old lawyer because it's just, it's just about your knowledge base and your experience. I mean, things do change from time to time. You just keep up with it. It's no big deal. Uh, the problem is, in the technology world, is this crap changes massively. Again, remember when I was running around, you know, being uh, in the corporate world, right? I mean, I, I remember when 802.11b came out. I remember they were playing with the first 802.11b, uh, you know, access points, trying to figure out how the hell to make those damn things work, right? Things change. So that's the thing. If, if you have an environment, with, with, there is no Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi literally doesn't even exist. You're going to build security based off of Wi-Fi not existing. Once Wi-Fi exists, now you have to start dealing with things like wi uh, MAC address filtering, maybe, uh, you know, WEP and WAP and, you know, different encryption protocols and that kind of thing. Once you go to BYOD, this, this changes, this changes the dynamics. You know, once you start leaving serverless architecture, you go to service-oriented architecture, or you go from client-server architecture to, ser to uh, service-oriented architecture to serverless architecture, like all these different architectures, they, they require a different way of thinking about things, especially Especially from, from a security standpoint. Again, you think about this for a lock-in. Uh, when you think about owning your data, 20 years ago, data lock-in wasn't the biggest problem, right? You own the database server. However crappy that database server was, you owned it. It was sitting right there. So it may burn up in a fire, but that's about all you I mean, that's, that's what you had to deal with. Uh, in the modern world, right, if you're using uh, uh, AWS Aurora or you're using Google's database engine or you're using Microsoft's database engine, right, their, their cloud database engine, now one of the questions is, is that that data lock-in, once you've now put all of your data onto their infrastructure, you need to be thinking about how the hell can you pull it out if you need to in the future. Right. The, this is this is how this is new stuff that you need to be thinking about, and your strategy needs to change with time. Um, one of the big things too is to be thinking about is a solution for one threat will prevent numerous other threats. Again, if if you have a disaster recovery solution that 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 means your systems can stay up and running, uh, or basically your services can stay up and running, even if a tornado comes through and it wipes out your entire data center, guess what? That means you have a solution for ransomware too, don't you? Right? Again, if you if you have solutions for, you know, firewalls, you know, proper firewalls to make sure hackers can't get into your infrastructure, that also means that if viruses are let loose within your infrastructure, it's most likely going to shut things down too. If you if you prevent your users from, from installing stupid crap onto their computers, again back in the day it was Napster for me. I don't know what the hell it is for you folks, any more free video games or porn video players or whatever else, right? That's the whole thing, right? Like if you have the ability to install crap onto your computer, your users are going to install what they want to install. Well, here's the thing. You remove the ability for them to install porn or whatever else on their computer. It also prevents the damage from a spear phishing attack when somebody sends a virus to them. They double click on it because they're a user. And if that is not able to get installed or to be executed or fired off, it solves a problem. So that's one thing when you start looking at cybersecurity realistically is you start looking at these, these wide like categories of problems and then you start trying to solve for those entire categories. Uh, when we start looking at threats, uh, the first threat to be talking about in, in this thing is employees. Um, oh, employees. <laughs> employees. Have I told you I had employees back in the day? As I have said, the, proud, the proudest day for me for Silicon Dojo is when I will need to hire an employee to be able to keep up with the work. The saddest day for me for Silicon Valley Shop is when I'm going to hire an employee so I can keep up with work. Mm. Employees, they're just so much fun. They're just so much fun. Things to be thinking about with employees and the threat of employees. Um, employees trying to game systems somehow uh, in order to be able to do things that they want to do, right? If they try to backdoor, if they try to get around your security, all of a sudden that can cause large problems. So let's say you have firewalls, you have blacklists set up uh, so that your employees can't get to porn sites, they can't get to the BitTorrent sites, all of that kind of thing to try to prevent them from pulling things into your, uh, into your company internal infrastructure that may cause a problem, right? If they understand how proxy servers work, 
or if they try to use a VPN or something like that, they're able to do that. They're able to bypass the security that you've already installed. Then all of a sudden, right, you, you, you now have threats to your system that you were trying to defend against. Uh, People, employees trying to game the system is a huge thing. Uh, employees, uh, dumb mistakes. Um, you know, the whole thing, like, like well, what happens if the secretary accidentally da that deletes the database? Right, because again, you think about this with a database. So when you have a database, MySQL, anything else, right, it's basically a file. It's more or less a file uh, that you connect to. So you use another piece of software to connect to it. And so a lot of times, uh, people think about the privileges of the database user. So if you're using, let's say, MySQL, there's actual database users. You create a user with certain privileges within MySQL, and they're allowed to do things with tables and databases or whatever else. And here's the thing, that's all within MySQL. Uh, what, what happens <laughs> if you didn't secure the actual database file itself and the secretary uh, accidentally uh, deletes the database? <laughs> Hey, real world. Um, I think about this uh, with my poor stepfather. Oh, my poor stepfather. The, old, the older you get, the worse you feel about your parents. It's kind of funny when you're like 18 years old, you're like, screw all these old people. And then you like to get to be older. <laughs> you're like, wow, I was a jackass. Anyways, I remember we had this old 286 computer, and he was using it to go to college. Oh, so horrible. <laughs> so horrible. He was using it to go to college. And anyways, I was learning DOS at the time, because again, it was the 90s, so I was learning DOS. I was trying to learn computers back then, long, long before I actually started learning knowing what to do. Anyways, I'm going through, cleaning all this stuff up, and then um, I went into the directory, and there was like star dot star. There was something in the DOS directory that said star dot star. And so I was going through, I was cleaning up, I was being all, and so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I typed in D-E-L space star dot star. Um, wildcard period wildcard <laughs> delete every file on the computer yeah so basically I just kept deleting files on the computer <laughs> until it became non-functional <laughs> and just crashed. Uh, oh don't allow your employees to do stuff like that if your employees are able to do something like that it, it's not that the employee was stupid yes the employee was stupid but it means you were not doing your job uh, and then also nefarious actors and when we talk about nefarious actors, oh my golly, the crap that employees will do will just blow your mind. Uh, so I picked out this uh, particular article. IT exec who sabotaged organ donation records sentenced. So again, when we're talking about asshats in the world, who the hell sabotages organ donation records? Intentionally. This isn't like the ransomware people were like, oh, we so sorry, we didn't mean to attack the hospital. No, this guy, or this person knew what they were doing. The IIT director of a nonprofit organ procurement center for more than 200 hospitals in Texas was sentenced last week to two years in prison for intentionally deleting numerous organ donation records and other data after being fired from her job. Once inside the network, uh, Duane uh, used an administrator account belonging to another LifeGift employee to log into several servers, including the company's organ donor database server and main accounting server, multiple times. Over the next several hours, she then deleted donor records, accounting invoice files, database and software applications, backup files, and the software tokens needed to run some applications. In a bid to cover her tracks, uh, Duan uh, manually deleted all logs that were VPN sessions with the company's network. She also disabled the activity logging functions on the database and accounting servers, making it impossible for LifeGift to identify all the individual files and applications she deleted, the court document said. So hey, remember when I was talking about a zero-trust environment? <laughs> yeah. Not being paranoid here. I mean, come on. When you realize employees will go after organ donation records, now you, now you might start to understand why bosses are losing their minds. Again, I have, I, have this little, I have this little thing. You'll see it on the wall every once in a while. Bosses are people too. Again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying bosses don't make mistakes. I'm not saying bosses are not a-holes or whatever else. I'm not saying that, you know. I'm just, I'm just saying, remember. <laughs> When you see me make these comments, just, just realize that this is, this is real. Um, next thing, again, when you're thinking about cybersecurity, one of the big things to ask yourself is what about natural disasters? What happens in flood, fire, earthquake? Uh, again, screenshot, this is from August 27th, yesterday, I guess. Western Europe can expect more heavy rainfall and fatal floods as the climate warms. 
right? A lot of times when we see pictures, an important thing to understand whenever we're seeing these, uh, these, this disaster porn uh, that, that the news media is keep, keeps pushing on us, and most of the time they're going to show us houses, right? I mean, good disaster porn really requires a little girl crying over her dead dog. <laughs> That's how you get the clicks. Anyways, right, you know, having, having people looking at their houses, crying over their houses, that are, I mean, this is legit, don't get me wrong, it's legit, but, but this is what they always focus on. But remember, most of these places where these, there are these houses, they also have business districts. Like, it doesn't make you emotional to see an office building get washed away. I think, I think people should be more emotional about it, but whatever, that's everybody's problem, right? They're not going to show you office buildings getting washed away. They're not going to show you retail stores getting washed away. So when you see this, it's very easy to think, oh, you know, it's these poor people, but this doesn't have anything to do with my job. What you really got to be thinking about, though, is, again, we've got wildfires in Turkey, wildfires in Greece, wildfires in Portugal. Uh, you know, a massive chunk of the U.S. is burning right now. Tennessee just had massive floods. Again, from as as the cybersecurity professional for your environment, what happens if your entire building goes bye bye? If the answer is your company goes bankrupt, you're failing at your job. Uh, normal normal crime. Again, this is something people don't think about. Everybody's all worried about the Chinese hackers. Oh, Chinese, check them out. Right? Normal crime is the buggers. <laughs> Crackheads don't know what an Active Directory server is. Again, you, you, you'll notice I spent a little while doing IT in Baltimore. <laughs> There's a certain, a certain panache or whatever, certain things that I say. And yeah, that was a big problem, right? <laughs> hey, look, crack, crackheads need crack. They're going to get crack one way or the other. And if they got to steal something in order to get their crack, they're fine with stealing something. And when they break into your business, again, yeah, they, they do not know the difference between a top-of-the-line gaming rig <laughs> and your active directors. <laughs> Crackhead, walk out of your business with your Active Directory and sell it to a pawn shop for $25. <laughs> it sucks, it sucks. Real thing to be thinking about, what happens there, all right? Um, VA, VA has been losing a lot of crap. Uh, but anyways, uh, VA loses another laptop with veterans' personal data prompting an inquiry. A contractor with the Department of Veterans Affairs had an unencrypted laptop stolen last month that contained the personal data of over 600 veterans and a second laptop owned by another contractor due VA was stolen in May, according to the ranking uh, Republican on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. So again, as a, as a person responsible for cybersecurity for the VA, a big question is why the hell is anything leaving the premises unencrypted? I mean... Let's get beyond. Let's get beyond why they are leaving their laptops in their car so crackheads can steal their laptops. Beyond that, again, think about that with, with data security. Why? Why is the data unencrypted? Why were they able to walk off of premises with unencrypted data? This is a failure in the cybersecurity mechanisms. Um, threat. Rat's nest. Again, remember with, with cybersecurity, it's all about uptime. It's all uptime, keeping data and all that kind of stuff. Oh, we all know this is real. <laughs> we all know this is real. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? You you walk you walk in you walk into your server room, and you're like, okay, we're doing a migration today. We're moving from server 2012 to server 2019. So what we're gonna do? What we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in the 2019 server, and we're gonna unplug the 2012 server. Yeah. Did you, did you just unplug the 2012 server, or did you just unplug the storage array? <laughs> Inquiring minds would like to know. The problem is things like things like this with like Rat's Nest, where we see a lot, is that a lot of times uh, for, for computers and for systems, uh, it's called a layer one problem. Like 99, in the, in the networking world, they say 99% 99, 99 of all problems are layer one problems. Layer one problems is the physical connection, the actual wire connection between devices. Essentially, something gets unplugged. And so one of the problems is if you walk in, again, to your data center, to your network closets, and they look like this, this is a disaster waiting to happen. So one of your jobs needs to be when you're trying to figure out how to get the CEO to purchase tens of thousands of dollars of all that fancy cyber security equipment you want, uh, the first thing you need to be doing is going through and cleaning this crap up generally after hours so that you don't run into a problem. 
Because again, if your if your server goes off, if a service goes offline, right? Like all you're gonna know is that a service went offline. Uh, people are no longer able to authenticate. VPN services are no longer functioning. X, Y, or Z. Then it's going to be your job to figure out what the hell's happening. Well, my, I, I might look at there. That that might be the problem. Uh, threat. Stupid problems. Things to be thinking about. What happens when a backhoe goes through your fiber line? If you're dealing with cybersecurity for your facility, you're getting resiliency, uptime, all that kind of thing. Do you have failover? It is now 2021. Getting internet connections is relatively easy. Uh, literally, the internet connection I have for Silicon Dojo, it's 25 up, 25 down off of an LTE. I have an AT&T business class. Again, I know 25 up, 25 down is not some huge amount of bandwidth. But again, for a business that has to get business done, 25 up, 25 down is good enough. And so think about this for, for your infrastructure. If a backhoe goes through your fiber line, you know, you normally have a gig per second connection what are you going to fail over to? Failing over to an LTE hotspot, you know, might be good enough to keep your business going. You need to be thinking about that. Uh, again, somebody unplugging the Active Directory server, going into your rat's nest, oops. Uh, or things like uh, software as a service, single IP address issues. This is an interesting problem. So if you deal with Salesforce, any kind of software as a service, they normally have uh, chunks of IP addresses. And so basically when you go to log in to Salesforce or whatever else, through DNS and through load balancing, they'll send you to one of their IP addresses. Uh, one of the interesting things is sometimes, sometimes uh, that software as a service, um, one of their IP addresses can be having a problem. So maybe the server on that side is having an issue. Maybe somebody, maybe that server, somebody went through, used a backhoe to go through the fiber line for that particular server. But you can have these weird intermittent issues where these people are able to log into to Salesforce just fine. But these people are over here having all kinds of weird ass issues. And the reason is, is when they get routed uh, to whatever IP address for, for Salesforce, some people get routed to IP addresses that are functioning properly and some people get routed to IP addresses that are not functioning properly. Things to be thinking about from a cybersecurity standpoint. Again, we talk about dashboards and things. How can you monitor that type of thing uh, in order to keep uptime for your users? Again, it's one it's one thing to complain about Salesforce. Don't get me wrong, complain about software as a service all you want, but your job is to make sure your employee, the employees, can keep doing their jobs. So how do you deal with that kind of issue? Uh, vendor issues. This is a huge thing in the modern world. Uh, so supply chain attacks. So basically, when you when you buy equipment from vendors. How do you know that equipment isn't compromised? And how, and again, a zero threat environment, how are you building your infrastructure so even if it is compromised, it's not gonna take everything down? Uh, again, supply chain attacks are basically where governments or hackers go after the supply chain itself. So the Chinese, Chinese folks, uh, 10 years ago, they were, <laughs> they were putting viruses directly into brand new hard drives. If you bought a 500 gig or a terabyte hard drive, again, 10, 12 years ago at this point, most of those hard drives were being used by institutions or government organizations. And so the idea was, if you infect the hard drive, when it leaves the factory, before it leaves the factory, and then people pull it out and they shove it directly into their storage arrays, those storage arrays are most likely going to be in government institutions or whatever else, right? You think pulling out a, a brand new product means it's de facto known good. Not a fact. It could, be, it could be hacked. Uh, NSA, NSA to one up the Chinese folks, they were actually intercepting Cisco equipment. Cisco equipment on its way from point A to point B. They were unwrapping the Cisco equipment. They were opening up the actual equipment, adding their own little hardware components so that they could spy, sealing everything up perfectly, and then keeping all the equipment going down the road. Again, you install that into your infrastructure. How do you verify whether your infrastructure is secure or not? Again, the claim, the claim that Huawei is able to backdoor into their own networking equipment. Here's a question for you as a cybersecurity professional. Let's imagine for a second that your equipment has backdoors. Have you designed your infrastructure in such a way that even if those backdoors exist, they cannot be utilized? That's what you need to be thinking about. Again, then we get to uh, solar winds and all that kind of stuff. Uh, facility destruction. <laughs> this was a bad day. <laughs> this was a bad day for a lot of folks. Oh, OL, OVL, OVC. Anyways, there, 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 there's a hosting provider. There's a hosting provider, and they had a data center in France, um, and it went up in flames. It went up in flames. Millions of websites 
offline after fire at French cloud service firm. A fire at a French cloud service firm has disrupted millions of websites, knocking out government agency portals, bank shops, news websites, and taking out, out a chunk of the .fr web space, according to internet monitors. Uh, so that, that was a data center right there. <laughs> that data center went boom. Again, we always think about like hacker, or not, or uh, terrorist, right? Terrorist, ISIS, what if ISIS does something? Yeah, what if, what if you just have a dumbass who builds a data center basically in shipping containers? <laughs> I still don't understand why that's able to happen. Have you ever seen a data center? <laughs> that, that shouldn't happen. But again, something to think about. Okay, okay, your servers, or your, your systems, and they're just melted. What's your plan now? Um, and then we have a database problem with, uh, with uh, Microsoft, Microsoft's actual database uh, just got hacked and compromised up to 500 companies. Again, things to be thinking about with things like encryption. Even if I'm storing data up on cloud services, if somebody's able to access that, is it encrypted in such a way that, it be, that it's not actually useful to them? Uh, and then finally, and I really am putting this at the end. I really am putting this in at the end, and I'm putting it at the end for a reason, because it's at the end. The final threat to be worried about is hackers. Actual hackers are probably the least of your problems. <laughs> Uh, by focus on hackers, you may miss much uh, of the more pressing issues that your, your company has. Um, again, I think about this with one of the clients that I have, I've talked about before. I went in, I, you know, I fixed their, their Active Directory server, I fixed their network, and I installed surveillance systems, I installed all this kind of stuff. And then we started having the discussion about security, so where their server room was. Um, it was open, like theoretically uh, the public could get into the server room. And so I just went through the whole spiel about, hey, what if a crackhead steals your Active Directory server? That would be a bad thing. And somehow in that conversation, it came up uh, that they were in a floodplain. <laughs> oh, it gets better than that. So this was on the first floor. This was on the first floor, right? So I'm sitting there talking with them about being in the floodplain. Like, okay, well, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> so this server is basically on the floor of the first floor of a building in a floodplain. And then beyond that, when we sat there talking, uh, when they made additions to the building, they literally, in order to be able to expand the building, they had to agree to, with the county to actually have breakaway walls. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> so these two, like massive, 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 like, I don't know, a couple hundred feet walls. Anyways, when I say breakaway walls, I'm not talking about 10 feet. I'm talking about like, huge walls. These walls, if there's enough water pressure, the idea is that they will literally just snap away <laughs> so that the water is able to freely go through the building. Not only did they explain all of this, but it wasn't a theoretical thing. They had already had the building flooded once, and they were talking about going in there with shovels and scraping out the dirt after the flood. And, uh, and yes, all of their server equipment and data comm equipment and all that kind of stuff was sitting on the first floor. Um, this is one of those things where you need to talk with your CEOs, you need to continuously have conversations with the executives and everything else, because, again, I I'd had all the conversations I thought were important, and antivirus, and firewalls, and networking, and like all of the technical stuff I, I, I had I'd hit all the, 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 the goals on. Um, I, I had no clue they were in a literal floodplain. So one of the problems you get to is, again, hyper-focusing on, on one threat. Many times there are other threats that are actually much more much more important for you. Um, having a full disaster recovery system solves both the flood and the ransomware problem. So this about 50 times at this point. Again, if a flood comes through and wipes out your server um, and you have a solution for that, then you also have a solution if somebody if, if ransomware comes in and encrypts everything, right? Don't you? One one type of solution solves both problems. You, you need to think about this. Uh, if your security prevents uh, an administrator from doing something stupid, uh, again, it will also block hackers. Again, that's that's something to be thinking about right there. When I showed you that example of that cr craphead, <laughs> craphead, I will say, right, an ex-employee uh, that was that was going in and screwing with a, an organ transplant. Um, organization, one of the things to realize is the reason they were able to do that is that their, their systems were that vulnerable. Somebody with the right username and password was able to go in and cause havoc on all those systems. If you create your systems in such a way to prevent that from happening, it also, at the very least, makes it a hell of a lot harder for hackers to go after your systems. Again, like, again, in a zero trust environment, you need to be 
designing based off of what if your CIO decides to destroy your company? Is your infrastructure built in such a way that even if the CIO decides to tank your company, if nothing else, it's got to be very difficult for them to do. That's what you need to be considering. Um, Oh, and then uh, we get to security products. So whenever you start thinking about, again, we start thinking about cybersecurity, a lot of people think about antivirus, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, load balancers, all kinds of different stuff out there. Um, there's a lot of different products, especially in the 2020s. There's so many products. There's proprietary products and open source products, DIY products, and crap that'll be delivered to your door. What you're going to buy, again, it's going to depend on your environment and your situation. Things to be thinking about is support. Uh, so again, a lot of new people really love open source. Well, why am I going to spend X amount of money on a firewall? I'm just going to build you know, one of those open source firewalls. One of the questions to ask yourself is what happens when that open source firewall fails? <laughs> right, support is a beautiful thing. Support is an awesome thing, again, especially in the enterprise world, like you buy Cisco or you buy Juniper or you buy Checkpoint or whoever, you know, whatever they're buying nowadays. Uh, when you buy the equipment, you also buy a support contract. And so normally you set it up, everything's working, it should be fine. If something goes sideways, you call them up and say, hey, things went sideways, fix it. Again, you, you may you may gag a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand dollars a year for that support contract. You may be horrified by that. But when you look at how much money the business is going through day in, day out, support contracts might not be a bad thing. Uh, again, the cost, the cost of actually buying the equipment, again, remember free is not necessarily free. The scalability, when you buy your security equipment, is it going to scale with your company, right? If you're going out there and you're buying certain firewalls or whatever else and they max out at 20 users, that's fine if you're going to stay under 20 users. What happens if you need to go up to 40 users or 50 users to 60 years, users? Again, one of the things you need to be thinking about is the in institutional knowledge and how you're going to build institutional knowledge knowledge for the next five years. So you may be able to use a sonic wall. Let's say sonic wall is pretty easy, right? You right now may be very comfortable with sonic wall. And so you decide, okay, we're going to install sonic wall. Well, the issue is, let's say, let's just say, let's just say sonic wall maxes out at 20 users. One of the problems you're going to run into is once you hit 20 users, not only are you going to buy a new piece of equipment, but you might have to learn an entirely new uh, company's way of doing things, right? If you're used to SonicWall and all of a sudden now you have to learn Cisco in order to get everything up to speed, that's going to be difficult. Not only do you have to learn Cisco, but then anybody who's going to be supporting also has to learn Cisco. That's a tremendous load, uh, right, for, for everybody to learn and get up to speed. So something you may be thinking about is maybe don't buy the Sonic Wall to begin with. You're like, you know what? I know our company is growing. I know what direction we're going in and so instead of buying a stopgap measure now I'm going to get everybody trained I'm going to get the budget so that we can buy the equipment that we can actually scale with Something to be thinking about uh, reliability again we think about price points and all that kind of stuff when you're dealing with equipment equipment fails power supplies fail you know software software has is buggy Right? So things you need to be thinking about, whatever product you buy is how reliable it is. Uh, total cost of ownership of the product. Again, we start talking about things like open source. The reason that Microsoft is still so prevalent in the enterprise world, even though Linux is free, is because $600 for a server license and $50 for CALs uh, actually, at the end of the day, cost less money than the free Linux, right? So many people are trained in Microsoft. So many people have experience in Microsoft. So many people understand how that system works that spending you know, a few thousand dollars on a Windows server is actually less expensive, total cost of ownership, uh, than trying to spin up Linux servers or something like that. And then the other thing to be thinking about is interoperability with security products. So uh, we'll talk about this with things like two-factor authentication, other security products out there. Again, if you've got Active Directory servers and you want to use a physical two-factor authentication device, <laughs> then you need to find a two-factor authentication device that works with Active Directory. <laughs> You're like, but I want to use this one. This one has a great price, and it has great usability, and it will scale well. Yes, but does it work with Active Directory? No. <laughs> and what are we talking about? What are we talking about, right? And that, that's, again, that's what you need to be thinking about with these devices. Do they, do they work well with each other? Uh, and then finally, the final slide, again, big thing to be thinking about, uh, floods. All the rest of this kind of thing is disaster recovery and resilience. 
In the modern world, a big thing to be thinking to realize is that backups are not enough. Again, I was there for the days where if you had a tape backup, you were doing your job. Oops, the server melted. Don't worry, I have a tape backup. It might take you a week to get the server back up and running, but you did your job because you had a tape backup. It's the 2020s. <laughs> That is some, that's some naked people in the dawn of a new age at this point, right? Not only do you need to keep that data, but you need to have it in a form that can be usable as fast as possible. Disaster recovery is about having functionality back ASAP. Um, high availability is a big thing. So again, the idea with high availability is you have multiple servers. They're all doing what's called a heartbeat signal uh, between them. Uh, if one of the servers fails, so what's considered the primary server fails, the other one basically auto, auto promotes itself to being a primary and the users don't even realize anything happened. That's a form of high availability. Again, failover, failover with databases or anything like that. Hybrid cloud solutions. Again, that's where we talk about things like disaster recovery as a service. You have your, your local infrastructure, so you hate the cloud. Cloud is bad for some reason. You have a hybrid cloud model, right? So you have your localized infrastructure, you have all your servers, all that kind of stuff here. They use Veeam. Um, in order to back up into virtual instances, those virtual instances get uploaded. That gives you an offsite backup. And then if, some, if your server room melts down, you're able to spin up all those instances on that disaster recovery as a service platform. Your users are able to interact with it. And then, you know, you have all the time in the world to go about building the rest of your infrastructure. And that is the introduction class. <laughs> that is the introduction to cybersecurity, right? Introduction. We're not even talking about the products and all that kind of stuff yet. But I just wanted to give you this basic uh, level of basic level of what is going on in the cybersecurity world. So then when we start talking about products, when we start talking about different technologies, that you can then mentally put those technologies into the appropriate place for whatever it is that you're dealing with. Again, you know, with technology, it's that whole thing. It's your environment, it's your situation, it's, it's what, what needs to happen, what problems are you trying to solve uh, inside your company or organization, and then you put in the products depending on what that is. It might be firewalls, it might be antivirus, it might be antivirus, it might be a whole bunch of different things. It's not, it's not about one thing. Like I saw this with, um, I lost my mind a number of years ago. There was a company called Cujo. It's a company called Cujo. Uh, they created a, uh, a security device uh, for your for home networks. So again, the idea was IoT. So IoT is a big thing. So you're going to put this device on your network, and it's going to secure your network. And the reason that I lost my mind with Cujo, and I'll still keep smacking them until the day I die, is if you went to their website, because I actually interviewed their, their CEO back in the day, and I actually had their product. It was a pretty crappy product, honestly. But I went to their website, and the interesting thing was there was a lawyer there. There was a lawyer there, and the testimonial was, I'm so happy to have a Cujo device, because now I know my network is secure. <laughs> and I was like, what? We're not even gonna go into how little information Cujo gave you about what it was doing on your network it was its own set of problems. But the fact that somebody would say, like the idea that this device secures your network. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Net security is a big old thing. You figure out, you know, the vectors, you figure out the vulnerabilities, you figure out who you think is going to attack you, and then you try to solve for those problems. You don't just plug something in and done. Right? It's not a firewall, it's not this, it's that, right? And so that's what I want you folks uh, to be thinking about when you go out there and start trying to do cybersecurity on your own. So again, this will be uh, the beginning of, I don't know, a 15 to 20 part class initially, and then I'm sure we'll have a hell of a lot of addendums uh, as we go. We'll start talking about the products and all that kind of stuff. Um, as always, I enjoy uh, teaching uh, this particular class. Uh, do remember, this is all free to the end user. Free to the end user isn't actually free. <laughs> Somebody's got to pay for all this stuff. So we like to throw a couple of dollars in. Again, if you find what I'm doing to be valuable, that's all I'm saying. If what I'm doing is valuable to you, think about throwing a couple of dollars in to help support what I'm trying to do here. So, uh, so yeah, with that, um, I had fun. I hope to see you at the next class.